Hello, Purdue students, and welcome to Boiler Inclusion. I'm Margot Monteith, a professor in psychological sciences, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today to share a presentation about boiler inclusion. This is such an exciting time for all of you. It's a time when you're getting to know other people and forming relationships, some of which will last a lifetime. You'll have the opportunity while at Purdue to get to know people who differ in many ways in terms of ethnicity, race, class, religion, nationality, sexuality, gender identity, philosophy, ideology, lifestyle. And what I'm going to talk with you about today is choosing to embrace that diversity and behave in inclusive ways towards others. So to get us started, I'd like for you to think for a minute about whether you've interacted with people who have a variety of backgrounds, races, cultures, and other identities since you've been at Purdue. Maybe you have and maybe you haven't. Think about whether you've had the opportunity for such interactions. Oftentimes we feel really naturally drawn to people who are similar to ourselves and we don't even consider talking with other people. Or maybe you have felt uncertain about how to start a conversation with others or nervous about saying the right thing. I'm going to talk with you about engaging with diversity at Purdue and also how to handle any concerns that you may have. So many of you here might be thinking about becoming a scientist or a researcher. Did you know that there's an entire field of research that's dedicated to understanding how people with different backgrounds and identities interact with each other? I conduct research in this area and the team of, of people who are responsible for producing this presentation likewise strive to understand how people engage with and, um, and behave in inclusive ways in diversity contexts. So you can be assured that all of the information that I share with you today is based on state-of-the-art research. Let's first consider diversity at Purdue. Purdue has international students from all parts of the world map. The only countries not represented are those shown in white. 43% of our students are women, 77% are undergraduates, 46% of our students are from Indiana, and 31% from other states, and 23% of our students come from other countries. Although a majority of our students, 58%, are white and from the United States, many other races and ethnicities are also represented on campus. But these are just some of the factors that make our campus diverse. People have many other social identities, such as sexual orientation, gender identity, ability differences, religion, the financial situation of your family, and so on. And we don't have just one social identity, but each of us has many identities that are important to us. So take a few seconds now to think about your social identities and, and what's important to you in terms of identity from this wheel or ones that aren't on this wheel. Now with all of these social identities, I'll bet that every one of you will sometimes feel like you're in the majority on Purdue's campus, but at other times you can feel like you're in the minority. So for example, a white male will often feel like he's in the majority, but if he also identifies as gay, sometimes he'll feel like he's in a minority. A black student may be in the numerical minority in a class, but if English is her first language, then she may also feel like she's in the majority. Now for some of you, this may be the most diverse environment you've ever experienced. What a shock. And for others of you, this environment actually may be much less diverse than what you're used to. Now that's really a shock, especially when you look around and you don't see many other people who look or sound like you. Now for groups who aren't well represented on campus, the experience of being in a numerical mi minority may bring up some questions or concerns. For one, when you look around and don't see people like you, you might wonder, do I belong? Are people like me welcome here? Can people like me succeed here? You also might worry that people won't see you for you, but instead will see you on a group stereotype. 
And if there are awkward or uncomfortable interactions, you might wonder, why was I treated in that way? And whether it has something to do with your race, ethnicity, religion, gender identity, or any other identities. Now, for people who are in the majority, these questions don't pop up. But for people in the numerical minority, these questions may arise many times, sometimes even several times in a single day, and they can serve as an extra burden. Now, every student here was admitted to Purdue, and that means that you belong. This is a fact, pure and simple. And every one of us can choose to make our, our campus an, invi an inviting and inclusive environment where people feel like they belong. Because in addition to all of our different social identities, we all have one common identity. We're all part of the Purdue community. We come together to create a common and overarching group, the Purdue group. And every one of you at Purdue belongs here, you can thrive here, and you will benefit from diversity at Purdue. And at Purdue, we value diversity. So I could just stop my presentation here and say, okay, just go out and do it. Um, Purdue values diversity, you should too, go value it. All right, but what does it really mean to value diversity and to be inclusive? What can we actually do? And how do we deal with situations that might make us feel a little bit uncomfortable? Well, one challenge is that sometimes we may feel uncertain about how to approach conversations with people who have different backgrounds than us. Our minds may search for a casual way to start a conversation, and we just ask the first question that pops into our head. And sometimes we end up putting our foot in our mouth, and we end up saying or asking something that's actually based on a stereotype. Just how common is this? Well, let's take a look at some of these common stereotypes in a video. You got a scholarship because you're a minority, right? Where are you from? I mean, where are you really from? You were born in Fort Wayne? You look like one of those terrorists. Did you grow up on a reservation? I bet you're a good dancer. You don't look gay. You have a girlfriend? Were you born that way? Ni hao. I actually don't do that. Ever. Hey, do you know any uh, good Mexican restaurants around here? You like fried chicken, right? So you were in the army. Do you ever kill anybody? Huh. Looks like we got white privilege in the room. You have internet where you come from? Is it true you are terrible drivers? Oh my gosh, can I touch your hair? Is this okay? Are you a man or a woman? How'd you learn to speak English so well? Maybe because I was born and raised in Iowa? You're so articulate. Do you know any terrorists? Why are you and your friends so loud? Do you have PTSD? Why do you wear that uh, thing? on your head. You have a scholarship for basketball, right? Are you from Ecuador? Is that like a third world country? You can't feel anything below your waist, so how do you... Why do you wear that? <laughs> really? You're studying engineering? I bet you are good at math. So like, what's your deal? I mean, ethnically speaking. What's up? What's up? What's up? Just because I'm black, I don't actually say what's up. Now maybe, maybe you've had the experience of, hear, of hearing some of these comments. Purdue students have told us that they hear them over and over. And maybe you even recognize something that you've said to someone else. So we can choose to be more mindful and not say the first thing that pops into our head, which might be based on a stereotype. But sometimes, rather than risk saying or doing something that may be regarded as offensive, people will just altogether avoid interacting with others who are different from them. In fact, scientific evidence indicates that the number one reason people avoid interactions with others, um, it starts with an A and it has seven letters, and you may be thinking anxiety. Anxiety about interacting with people from other backgrounds and social identities is the number one reason people avoid those interactions. People have all sorts of fears about interacting with individuals who are different from them, 
like the feel, fear of being compared, judged, or critiqued, the fear that someone will put you down, the fear of appearing stupid, or the fear of saying or doing something that's offensive. Now, it's normal to have these worries, but what we don't realize is that just as we're walking around with our own sets of worries and fears, other people are too. And if we set those worries aside and take the plunge, we may experience some positive outcomes. Hope I'm in the right place. It says 11 a.m. Lab. I shouldn't have missed the first lecture. But come on, 8 a.m. on a Monday? What are we, farmers? Definitely international. Look busy, look busy. Okay, I got it. Phi Beta bro, you don't wanna talk. Probably wants to talk about soccer. Then he would correct me and say football. And it's always downhill from there. And they will probably have trouble understanding my English. I hope Judson is in this lab section. I hope I'm not the only white guy in this class. My name's Ella. It's pronounced like it's spelled E L L A. Well, unless you're Spanish. I'm Sebastian. Get out of here. You mean from like The Little Mermaid? Yeah, I, I guess. I'm named after a Disney character too. Well, no, I'm not named after. It's Ella, get it? Like Cinderella? Oh, I just love Disney, don't you? She seems <laughs> interesting. Under the sea, under the sea. If I Only black guy. What's new? Why are we devoting full time to floating under the sea? Fernando! Hey man, I was hoping you were going to be in this section. Judson! Hey, Seabass! He's my BGR buddy. You know Fernando? No, not really. We played football in high school together. Like, tackle football? What other kind of football is there? Dude's got a laser for a right arm. All-conference QB. Wow, really cool. You a Colts fan? I believe in blue, baby. Nice. We should sit next to Sebastian. He got a perfect on his SATs. Really? Uh, not really. I got 10 points short of a perfect score. We're sitting by you. You like chess? What? Chess. You like to play? Yes, I like to play chess. Do you? Yes, I do. Um, may I ask a question? Ask away. Is this a lab for the honor section of Engineering 141? I hope it is, or I'm in the wrong place. Hey, you know anything about this Professor Carol Andrews? Well, she's the professor of this section. Funny, but did she say anything about this section? She wasn't there. Don't tell me Mr. Genius missed Monday's lecture.
能我们都错了。Who's this guy? Now that definitely does not look like a Carol. Maybe it's Carl. One day when the boss gets hungry, guess who's gonna be on the plate? Uh oh. First things first. Yes. My first name is Carol. It's a family name of Polish descent, where Carol is more common as a male name. Now that you know about me, let's hear a little bit about you. So tell me your first name, where you're from, and your first impression when you walked into this classroom. Don't be shy. Who wants to go first? So you could see in this video that each student was initially very hesitant to interact with the others. And at first they let their fears and anxieties lead to avoidance. But once they did interact, everything went just fine. In fact, research shows that when people are trying to have positive interactions, their interactions will go well. It's the trying that's most important. And when we give interactions a try, we have the opportunity to discover that we're much more similar to others than we, than, than we might have thought, as in the video. Now that said, we've all probably had experiences where we, we were talking to someone and we completely put our foot in our mouth. Maybe we said something stereotypical or offensive and we really we didn't mean to. Now why does this happen? Why do people so often say, say and do things that are based on stereotypes? Well, it has something to do with implicit bias. Bias refers to any feeling, thought, or behavior that stems from stereotypes, like the stereotype represented in this meme that all Asians are good at math. <clears throat> bias can also be based on categorical thinking, as in there's an us and a them, and us is better. Now implicit means that bias arises from processes that are outside of our conscious awareness, without our intention. So we aren't thinking, I've got this stereotype, now how can I use it? Instead, the stereotype just pops to mind and influences our responses without, without us even giving it a second thought. Now a perplexing fact is that even really fair-minded and egalitarian people are prone to these implicit biases. People can truly believe in equality and consciously reject stereotypes, but implicit bias is still unconsciously activated in their minds and can, and can influence how they behave and act towards others. Let me give you an example that's based on a riddle. Now, if you've already heard this riddle, please don't yell out the solution I'm looking for, okay? Um, a father and a son were out driving. They got into a, a terrible accident. The father was killed and the son was rushed to the hospital. In walked the surgeon who took one look at the son and said, I can't operate, this is, this is my son. Now, how could this be? Father's in the car, the father gets killed, the surgeon walks in, says, I can't operate, it's my son. Well, there are various ways to answer this riddle. I've heard various answers, like um, it was a stepdad in the car and the biological dad in the operating room, or there are two gay dads. But let me ask, how many of you thought it's the mother? People are remarkably unable to come up with a solution, even in today's age, um, that the surgeon is the boy's mother. Let me tell you about my own experience with this riddle. I was in graduate school when I first heard it, and I was working on getting my PhD, so earning my doctorate. I am a woman, and I was studying stereotyping and prejudice. And yet, even with all these things, when I heard that riddle, I couldn't come up with a, a solution. I sat there thinking and thinking, and I, I finally said, it's a priest. The guy in the car is a father because he's a priest. So, I mean, I, I couldn't even come up with a solution, conjure an image of the surgeon being the mother, all right? 
So the mind works behind the scenes to distort our perception of people and of situations based on societal stereotypes. And the problem starts with the fact that we all have knowledge of cultural stereotypes, even if we don't believe that those stereotypes are true. They're learned and ingrained in our minds early in life, through the TV, on the internet, what we hear others say, through the media. Research shows that children learn the major stereotypes about groups by the age of five, and this is well before they've been able to have the personal experiences and interactions to develop their own sets of beliefs. And once this stereotypic knowledge is stored in memory, our minds rely on these stereotypes when perceiving others. So that's why I couldn't imagine the surgeon being a mother. So we see others through glasses that are tainted by bias. For instance, let's look at just a few examples of some research findings. So in this study, the participants were told that a child they'd be watching was either from a poor or a wealthy family. Then all participants watched the same video of the child taking an oral exam where she gave her answers out loud. And afterwards, participants were asked to answer questions about her ability level. And those who had earlier learned that she was from a poor family thought that she had much less ability than those who thought she was from a wealthy family. Now they had watched the same child taking the same exam and giving the same answers out loud. And yet, whether they thought she was poor or wealthy dramatically influenced how they rated her ability. Other research has shown that people, including the police, see black children as older and less innocent than white children. Research has shown that women leaders who behave in the same competent way as male leaders are viewed as less likable and have lower chances of being hired or promoted. Now, in this kind of a study, participants play a very fast-paced computer game where a guy appears on the screen, and sometimes he's holding a neutral object, like a coffee cup or a Coke bottle, and sometimes he's holding a gun. And participants are told to quickly push a shoot button if the guy is holding a gun, but otherwise don't respond. So if a frame comes up, you know, and it shows like the first guy here, then they should quickly push shoot. If it's the second guy, they should not push shoot. Now sometimes the guy's wearing a turban and sometimes he isn't. And it turns out that people mistakenly shoot a man holding a neutral object more often if he's wearing a turban than if, than if he isn't wearing a turban. These are just a few examples from thousands of studies, and biases like these often are not intended. The people in these studies most often don't consciously want to discriminate, but they do. Our bias glasses distort our perception of people, and as these research findings show, our biases can have discriminatory outcomes. Now, if implicit bias is influencing us automatically without our awareness, can we stop its operation? Let's watch a video of a Purdue student describing her experiences with implicit biases and how she learned to overcome them. Show, how, Fernie. God, so many freaking abbreviations. It's like chemistry all over again. <sighs> Spur. Soil, symbol, shoe, lemon. Little cousin Maddie? Uh, hey, Jesse. Hey. <laughs> oh. oh, so good to see you. Good to see you too. Actually, it's just uh, Matt now. Nobody calls me little Maddie anymore. <laughs> I can see that, Mr. Grown Up. What's the thing growing on your upper lip? Hey, I, I just shaved like two days ago. Sure, you did. <laughs> What does Auntie Iris think of it? Oh, Mom absolutely hates it. Calls it a snot mop. <laughs> she made me shave it for senior pictures, and Dad calls me Magnum P.I. <laughs> you know, some old TV show. You know, he thinks he's funny or something. Your parents are the best. They have their moments. But I think I'm ready to move out, you know? 
I completely understand. And I'm so excited you're coming to Purdue in the fall. Yeah, uh, you're going to be a senior, right? Yep. My last year here, <laughs> if all goes as planned. Oh, whatever, Miss Valedictorian. Well, that's one thing you're going to have to prepare yourself for. Purdue's a little tougher than Deer Lake Community. Yeah, and a little bigger. I mean, this thing is as confusing as the map of Westeros from Game of Thrones. <laughs> Fortunately, my best friend Maggie is meeting us here, and she's amazing. She gives tours as a student ambassador, and she knows this campus better than anyone. Well, that's good. Because compared to our hometown, this place is, like, ginormous. Did you have any trouble figuring it out your first semester? It took a while. And there's also adjusting to a new kind of environment. What do you mean? Well, how many people are in your senior class? 55, 60? 63. And you grew up with them. From kindergarten on, you were in youth group together, did 4-H, played sports, and you're all very similar. What do you mean? Like, we're all rural, simple country folk? <laughs> no. White. You're all white. Whoa, that doesn't bother me. Look, I get it. Purdue's diverse, but, but I'm cool with all cultures. You are. Yeah, uh, favorite artist, Jay-Z. Favorite athlete, LeBron. Favorite food, Chinese. And I took four years of Spanish class. Boom! That's nice, but it's not that simple. What do you mean? Like, you listen to Jay-Z, but have you ever had a conversation with a black person? Well... Uh... I hadn't either until I came to Purdue. So, like you, the only thing I knew about people who weren't white came from TV, sports, music, or the news. I cringe when I think back to how I used to act sometimes. Like what? So, okay, one example. One night, I was withdrawing money from the ATM and a black guy came up behind me. And immediately, all the stereotypes about blacks as criminals come flooding into my mind, and I'm scared. So scared that I grab the money as soon as the ATM spits it out and take off, leaving my bank card in the machine. He took your card, didn't he? How much did he steal? None. He did take my card. Then he looked me up in the student directory, sent me an email, and I got the card back the next day. Oh. Why did you think he'd stolen the money? Uh, well, he, he had your card, and I, and... And he was black? But that is not... No, I didn't say... I know. You made an assumption based on a stereotype, just like I did. I didn't even think. I just popped into my head. That's terrible. Does that make me a racist? No. It means that, in the absence of knowledge, you rely on stereotypes. <laughs> I've done the same thing, more than once. You have? And I felt guilty. Bad. That's not the kind of person I thought I was. Not the kind of person I want to be. I assumed I was better than that. I didn't like feeling bad about myself, so I decided to avoid any situation where that could happen. I stuck with my own kind. Did it help? Of course not, silly. It was a big mistake. It was the exact opposite of what I should have done. Oh, okay. If you're ignorant about something, does it help to just ignore it and hope it goes away? No. Exactly. You need to surround yourself with students from different backgrounds and cultures to change the way you think. You need to talk to people and actually get to know them so that when you encounter a black man at an ATM, you don't think of the stereotypical black criminal portrayed on TV. You think of your friend, Vince, in your bio class. Do you understand? Yeah, I got it. This might seem overwhelming, but after Maggie's tour, you'll have the campus down like this. No problem. The real challenge isn't how you navigate campus. It's how you navigate your relationships, especially with students who are different than you. It takes work. It 
It's not like you can just flip a switch and all the stereotypes embedded in your 18-year-old mind will instantly disappear. Hey, that's a 19-year-old mind. <laughs> Even more challenging. <laughs> Believe me, it takes practice. But over time, you'll learn to think about people differently and not based on stereotypes. And uh, you might meet some really incredible people you otherwise wouldn't. Jess, you didn't tell me you had a much older brother. Ha ha ha. Maggie, this is my little cousin, Matt. Just Matt. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Or you can call him Magnum. Oh, come on. <laughs> so, are you ready for the tour? Are you? Are you ready? Now, Matt and Jess came from a really small, very white community, and their only experience with black people was based on stereotypes. So Jess tells us how she became aware of her biases, and then she worked on changing the way that she thinks. And we can see that Matt can choose to do the same thing. Jess is describing what researchers call the self-regulation of bias. When Jess realized that she had a biased response, that she was stereotyping the black man at the ATM, she started to feel bad. She felt guilty because she didn't want to think of herself as a biased person, and she felt disappointed with herself because this wasn't how she wanted to behave. These feelings can be really uncomfortable, but instead of becoming defensive about it, Jess realized that she needs to pay attention to why these stereotypes came to mind. Her brain began to automatically reflect on the situation and take note of what was going on in it so as to establish what we refer to as cues. Um, these are just any, anything that, about the situation that was associated with engaging in that biased response. Like who was it around, who were you around, who was in the situation, what kind of situation was it? So how is this cue establishment help, helpful? Well, in the future, when there's the possibility of having a biased response again or using stereotypes, these cues interrupt ongoing behavior. And they help people to stop, to think twice, and to respond without bias, rather than generating a biased response. So back to Jess, when stereotypes come to mind now, she's learned not to fall prey to the same biases again. Or take my situation with the riddle. Anytime someone says, let me tell you a riddle, I think, oh, it could be a woman, it could be a woman. You know, or, or if someone says, I'm going to the doctor, I don't as automatically assume it's, it's going to be a male doctor. So this self-regulation is a way to confront and work on our own biases. But we may also be in situations where we notice other people doing things that are stereotypical or biased. Instead of standing by and letting these, these things happen and saying, well, you know, that's just life, we can stand up and talk with people about why their words or actions can be offensive or hurtful and how they might think about doing things differently. In other words, we can confront others about their bias when we see it. Now, I don't mean um, yelling at somebody or calling them names when I say confront. It can be something as simple as saying, hey, that's not acceptable. Or sometimes we can have dialogue about issues to share our perspectives. Those conversations can be uncomfortable, but they don't have to be, as you'll see in this video. Yeah, I saw you and heard you. Hey, blah, 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 blah. So why didn't you pass it? Come on, man, 30 feet out, you're not gonna hit that. Nigga, please. I got Steph Curry range. Four, three. E, look me up, ball, ball, ball. Two out of three, here we go. Save it for next game, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, man. I'm just saying, I was open. And so was Eric for the layup. I know math major, but three's better than two. Oh, man. <laughs> You're exhausted. And why didn't you dunk it? Probably because of gravity. 
I could down a 360 windmill. <laughs> In your dreams. And you can dunk? Double pump reverse is my specialty. Nigga, please. You guys heard the new single from Kendrick Lamar? Uh, yo, I'm gonna take a shower. You ready for the event at the BCC tonight? Good game, Will Jack. And you too, E. What up? You know that thing you said earlier? About Kendrick Lamar? This song is dope, you should check it out. No, um, maybe later. Before that, when I said I could dunk and you said- Nigga. Yeah, uh, yeah, you don't need to say that again, ever. I didn't mean anything, but- I know, I know. It's just I thought we were friends. Of course we are. Joey calls you that. It's different when you say it. Because I'm white? E. Hey. Eric. Kendrick Lamar just said the word like three times in 10 seconds. You and Joey say it to each other in the hallway like you're saying hello. But the white boy can't say it? Because it matters who says it. <laughs> Okay, whatever. No, no, listen. It's like... Okay, when I was 12, I wanted to be Lance Armstrong. <laughs> Lance Armstrong? Yeah. Before all the cheating and stuff came out. You know, live strong. I had the bracelets, the t-shirts, the posters on the wall, everything. So for my 12th birthday, my parents surprised me with this bike, and it was dope. It had 24 speeds, racing tires, Tour de France, here I come. So they surprised me with this bike in the garage. I hopped on that thing and I took off. Kevin, put your helmet on. Okay, I put my helmet on first and then I took off. I was so excited. I mean, I was flying. And I got to the edge of my neighborhood and I said, what the hell, and just kept going. But after a while, I realized I was lost. And then I hit this dead end. So I'm going to turn around and this group of white guys pulls up on me in a Jeep. And the driver looks at me and says, hey, what are you doing in our neighborhood? And I was thinking, hey man, it's a free country. Yeah, nobody can tell you where to ride your bike. But it wasn't really a question. It was more of a, a threat. So I say, sorry, I'm, I'm lost. And then the passenger leans across the driver and he's like, don't you come around here again, hear me? And this was definitely a threat. So I jumped on my bike and I booked it. And then I heard, it might've been a shotgun, possibly a cherry bomb. I, I don't know. I was 12 and I was scared out of my mind. And then I hear this voice yell behind me, you come back here again and you'll be a dead nigger. Wow, that's awful. Yeah. So that's what I think of when a white person calls me the N-word. I get it now, man. I'm sorry. You still my brother from another mother? <laughs> you know it. Good, because <laughs> I cannot handle Joey on my own. <laughs> Now this was an intense confrontation and one that required a great deal of discussion. The point of it was not that all black people think it's okay for black people to use the n-word but not for white people. In fact, that's, that's not an accurate statement. The video illustrates how people can talk with each other to come to an understanding about why certain things might be offensive. Sometimes confrontations will involve discussing much more subtle or minor kinds of comments or actions. For instance, if someone tells a joke that plays on a stereotype of, of a black person, we might say, that's, that's really not funny. And in this video, a black person was confronting a white person, but anyone can engage in confrontation. 
And we call this ally confrontation, when somebody isn't a member of the group that's being targeted and yet engages in confrontation. So for example, um, a man, straight man might confront another straight man about a, co a comment that was made about gays that was biased. Or a man might confront another man or even a woman about a comment made about women. This kind of ally confrontation can be especially effective at stopping bias in its tracks. Research shows that any confrontation can be very effective, but when an ally speaks up, people really do stop and listen. They tend to have the most influence. So when Jess confronted Matt about his assumption about the guy at the ATM, she was very effective and she encouraged him to think about that assumption. The good news is that through confrontation, other people may end up seeing issues from a new perspective or learning something new that ends up changing their behavior. Or maybe they won't change, which, which is okay, that's their choice. But at least we've done our part to try to promote inclusive behavior. Now I do want to mention that there are, are formal reporting mechanisms for hate and bias at Purdue, and you can find them at the Diversity and Inclusion website. If you're being harassed, discriminated against, or otherwise targeted, you don't have to deal with it alone, nor should you. Now, a word about interacting with others who are different from us. The things I'm talking with you about today and the themes in the videos might seem kind of daunting, but actually, you'll find that there are simple, everyday things that you can do to foster inclusion among your fellow boilers. Things as small as making eye contact, a friendly nod or smile, or sitting next to someone you've never sat to, next to in a class. Interaction is the number one way to get over any anxiety that you might have, to reduce biases, and to foster an inclusive environment. When we smile at someone or sit by them in a class, we're more likely to talk with them. If we're more likely to talk with them, then we might talk with them again, and even seemingly very small interactions might turn into friendships across time. And keep in mind that learning to, to interact with others who are different from us can be an inter incremental process, meaning that improvement comes with practice. The more we do interact with people who are different from us, the better we'll get at it, and the better our interactions will go, as you'll see in another video. I know. I know, Mom. You don't need to apologize. I'll find something. Don't worry. I gotta go. I love you, too. Bye. Is the little VR bien pasado? No, él no apareció. ¿Y por qué no? ¿Por qué? Él dijo que estaba con su novia. De ninguna manera. Could you speak English, please? You know, it's kind of rude. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's rude to speak Spanish. No, no, I just... When you speak Spanish, I can't... I'm left out of the conversation. Mm. I mean, you do know that this party we're going to is at the Latino Cultural Center, so there may just be a few more rude people there. Rico! I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean... We know. It's okay. Are you okay? It's nothing. I... tried using my dining card and... It kept getting rejected, so I called my mom, and she's having financial issues. Oh. It's not a big deal. I just have to get a part-time job, that's all. Have you eaten today? No. Well, then we better hustle over to the LCC. I've heard it's being catered by Casa Fiesta, and that food goes fast. Casa Fiesta? Do you think they're hiring? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> Spicy or mild? It's spicy. Enjoy. Excuse me. Yes? Are you hiring? Are we hiring? Yes. Casa Fiesta. Oh. I don't know. You'll have to call the restaurant. 
Okay, thank you. This is so good. I've already had five. I wanted to get more, but I think people were starting to give me looks. <laughs> Doesn't this make you homesick? It makes me sick, but just in my stomach, not from my home. You don't like tacos? How is that possible? Are you, like, allergic? No. I am Argentinian. Oh. Tacos are Mexican. I am not. Don't worry, I made the same mistake. I mean, who doesn't like tacos, right? It's tacos. <laughs> Freshman year, I tell Connor here I'm missing my family. So to cheer me up, he takes me to Taco Bell. It cheered me up? I still told him like 20 times, I'm Argentinian, no quiero Taco Bell. Oh God, you're never gonna let me live that down. See, that's why we have parties like this, you know? Not only is there free food, but it's educational. Go on, Connor, tell her. How many countries speak Spanish? 21, and apparently they don't all eat tacos. <laughs> <laughs> Going. Well, what was up with the wallflower routine? Well, unfortunately, I've developed this annoying condition where I keep sticking my foot in my mouth. <laughs> All right, well, that sounds like you might need to see a doctor. And fortunately for you, there is a doctor here. That's okay. It's best to- Come on. So Dr. Romero may not be able to cure your condition, but I did hear that the good doctor is wanting to hire some new lab assistants. Really? Uh-huh. Kitchen. Uh... But after singing your praises, Dr. Romero wants to meet you. He does? Yeah, she does. <laughs> Dr. Romero, I'd like to introduce you to my good friend. This is Kelly Lewis. Nice to meet you, Kelly. I hear you're looking for a job. I'll give you two some privacy. So? I'm sorry about earlier. It's understandable. You heard my accent, I was holding salsa, and you assumed I was the caterer. But I shouldn't have. That was my fault. I'm truly sorry. It's okay. I feel like I've been apologizing a lot lately. It's been a rough day. Rico told me about your situation. My mom works really hard. But it's tough trying to make ends meet when you're raising three kids on your own. I was raised by a single mother, too. It's very difficult. Believe it or not, Kelly, I think we might have a lot in common. My office hours are in there. Come by on Tuesday and we'll talk about that job. Thank you, Dr. Ramiro. Thank you. And it was nice meeting you, for the second time. So Kelly relies on stereotypes many times in this clip, but she does keep trying. She doesn't get defensive, and we see her apologizing when she messes up. This illustrates that incremental process. The more we do interact with people who differ from us, the better we get at it, the less stereotypes come to mind, and the more we'll discover our similarities with others. You'll find plenty of opportunities to meet people from different backgrounds at Purdue, both informally, such as when you just you know, meet and talk with people, and through more formal avenues. On the more formal side, let me give a shout out to our wonderful cultural centers. These centers welcome all students who want to get to know people and their cultures. And you can always check out Purdue's diversity and inclusion website. Where in the right hand, uh, top right hand corner, you'll see a listing of current events, get togethers and lectures related to diversity and inclusion. 
But you still might be wondering, why is diversity so important? What are its benefits? What positive things can happen if you choose to engage with, interact with, study with people who are diverse in their social identities and backgrounds? Well, diversity expands our worldviews. When we're young, we're most often surrounded by others who are very similar to us. College is unique. It can open the door to people from all over the, the world without having to travel. If we want to un expand our understanding of the world, we can choose to get to know people with a diversity of social identities. Purdue diversity can also provide preparation for a global society and workforce. No matter what profession you enter, you will be around people with a diversity of perspectives and social identities. Diversity also leads people to better decision making and innovation. Research shows that people are more creative, they consider more perspectives of an, and information, and they're more innovative in diverse environments. And all of this results in better decision making. For instance, historically, um, men have, have been involved in the design of products for cars, resulting in seat belts that were safe for men, but they weren't safe for women, and especially pregnant women. Now with more women on design teams, Female crash dummies are required in safety testing, and hopefully this will cut down on the number of serious injuries to women who are in crashers. As another example, Google's computer vision system was initially developed by an all-white team, and it didn't recognize darker-skinned people as people. Now, many of you in here make up the next generation of engineers, designers, scientists, and so on. Bringing together your collective experiences and perspectives means that not only will you make better products, but you'll be able to help more people. So in closing, coming to college is a huge transition. And you have many different experiences that you're going to have while you're here. And I'd like for each of you to take a minute to think about how can you step outside of your comfort zone to contribute to an, an inclusive environment at Purdue? Maybe you can grab lunch from somebody from BGR that you haven't had the chance to connect with yet, or sit by somebody that you haven't talked to yet in a class, or if your roommate invites you to something going on at, the culture, at a cultural center, you can say, yeah, sure, I'll go. These little instances of inclusion can snowball across time so that you'll end up with friends and study partners who aren't just all like you, and so that you'll be able to benefit from the diversity at Purdue, at Purdue and grow as a person. Remember that discomfort is a sign that you are growing as a person, and that if you're too comfortable, it might be time to shake it up a little bit. We sincerely hope that you enjoy being a boiler and that you recognize that being, being a boiler means being inclusive. And as one final thing I want to note that we have um, pins, these boiler inclusion pins like our sh that are shown up here, that you'll be able to get as you exit after the next session. So be sure to grab one and put it on your backpack. So thanks so much for your attention.